Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you, some of you may remember I talked here in the fall about uh, d computational drug design, and apparently that was not crazy enough, so I'm trying to improve and, and do some crazy stuff today. Um, so qu that's why there's a question mark. <laughs> I want to cover my butt. Um, well, before we, we talk about this, I, I wanted to find out how many of you took quantum mechanics at any level? One. Okay. So the next few slides are not for you. Uh, because I, if we talk about quantum biology, I think we should preamble this with quantum physics. And I'll just cover the very basics so you know what is involved in quantum physics, quantum mechanics. And uh, that's a topic that um, has a long history. It's more than a century old, but it has not reached popular imagination yet. It's only for the experts. So it's replaced classical mechanics, classical concepts in physics that ruled for two centuries um, and involved positions of particles, masses, and trajectories, more or less along the lines of our intuitive thinking about objects, physical objects, and replaced um, these concepts with very abstract ideas. So, so some of it is very dif difficult and it's hard actually to, uh, to think about without abstract mathematical thinking. Uh, when, you, when you teach first year quantum mechanics to physics students, you usually tell, turn, tell them not to overthink it, just do it, uh, just solve equations. Um, but quantum mechanics was initially introduced to describe microsc microscopic phenomena, elementary particles and electromagnetic fields. And is based on postulates that emerged to explain some unexplainable, at that time, ex experimental observations in physics. There was five or six standard experiments that escaped the common grasp of classical physics and led to a revolution in physics as we know it. So it was at first innocuous, and this actually, to me, is a very apt parallel because in biology right now we also have a few observations, shall we say, that um, don't really fit into the classical scheme of things. Maybe this is the same as physics was a century ago, the same stage. So these postulates, um, are listed in the next few slides. Um, the first thing that you have to put in your mind when you, th when you think as a quantum physicist is to move away from, from the objects, hard objects with defined positions and momenta or velocities and introduce what's called the, the duality of matter, wave-particle duality. So matter and waves are not exclusive, they are the same. Waves can behave like masses and masses can behave like waves. It depends on what sort of experiments you subject these um, physical systems to. The second thing is, instead of thinking about a position of a particle, like the, your seat or the, the uh, parking space that you parked your car or the direction you're driving, um, you replace these things with um, something called a state. It's a wave function. It's a mathematical object. We'll come to it in a second. So don't think about sharp positions and sharp, sharp velocities. They don't exist. It's, it's a figment of our, our imagination. And the last key departure from our intuitive thinking is that energy has a continuum of values. Maybe to us at this level, yes, but at the level of particles and fields, energy is quantized in, in packets. Um, values that, are, that can only have integer multiple realizations of a quantum of energy. This actually is, for me, the most important parallel with biology, because as you will see, uh, in biology that's exactly the case even without straining your brain. If you know anything about biology, you'll know that biological energy is quantized in the form of biochemical energy, ATP molecules and GTP molecules, but it will come to this. 
And the, there are some consequences. I, unfortunately, you can't read some of it, probably. Um, some surprising consequences uh, emerge, and one of which is actually a very fundamental property if you introduce this um, conceptual framework called quantum mechanics. It's a consequence of introducing operators, we'll come to it, and wave functions. It's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. That means that at the level of particles and fields, microscopic world, uh, you cannot know at the same time with infinite precision both the location and the velocity, shall we say, or momentum of a system. You cannot know both of these things at the same time precisely. There is a limit, and if you can read it, the limit is the Planck constant divided by 2. Uh, so h bar. H, h is the Planck constant. h bar is Planck constant divided by 2 pi, and the limit is here, 1 half of the h bar. There is also an equivalent relationship for other, what we call in physics, complementary variables or complementary physical entities. So position and momentum is one. Momentum is mass times velocity. So it's, it's, you can think about velocity and position. And another one is for systems that rotate, the equivalent to position is the angle. And the equivalent to momentum is angular momentum. These two cannot be known at the same time precisely either. Um, the same applies to spin. Um, that's another physical quantum physics concept. Two components of the spin cannot be known at the same time. And finally, energy and time. You cannot know both at the same time precisely the energy of a particle and, its, and the time it was measured at. So this is counterintuitive because we're used to precise measurements. And actually, it was historically introduced as something very counterintuitive because Max Planck uh, introduced the energy quantization principle. He's the father of, of quantum mechanics and a very reluctant father of quantum mechanics at, at that because he was the dean of, of uh, celebrated dean of classical physics, statistical physics, in fact, and thermodynamics. And he tried to explain some, one of these experiments, black border radiation, the spectrum of of radiation emitted by uh, physical objects at different temperatures, and nobody could explain it, and, and various physicists tried and tried, and, and he eventually, against his own um, conviction, introduced some artificial assumptions, namely energy quantization, and it, he was able to explain that observation. That was the first major advance, and he became the father of quantum mechanics, a field that he didn't really believe in got Nobel Prize in 1918, and then he started believing, I guess. But actually, Max Planck is another interesting guy. I, I challenged my graduate students once to find anybody, so this is a challenge to you as well, in, in physics or in science in general, who, who made a major contribution to the world of science over the age of 40. That's a challenge for you, and, and actually a challenge for you to make these discoveries, because most of you are under the age of 40, so the time is right for you. And Max Planck is, is one example that was given to me. He was 42 at the time. He was a senior <laughs> citizen at the time. But anyway, so this is the formula uh, that, that he postulated. It's, it's a variation of a standard um, Boltzmann distribution in statistical mechanics to which quantization principle is put in by hand, so to speak. Without any uh, um, principle, only convenience. And so that's the value of the constant. It comes out of fitting experimental data. Uh, it's a fundamental constant, constant. It's a universal fundamental constant, one of several in physics that are, as we know, immutable and unchangeable. And at the bottom you have a formula for energy. This is another interesting thing that energy is related to the frequency of electromagnetic radiation. H is the Planck constant, nu is the frequency. So 
The second thing that, the second experiment in this series of five or six that changed the world of physics in early 20th century was the discovery of the photoelectric effect, namely that radiation can eject electrons from their um, valence states in metals and create currents. So we now know it, photocells. This is what we use in washrooms right here. You go outside and the washroom will operate when you step in. Maybe not this one, but one at NINT for sure does it. <laughs> and um, so Einstein exp explained it, again, against his own conviction. Actually, he never believed in quantum mechanics, and, um, but he also got the Nobel Prize for this. <laughs> not for special theory of relativity or, or general theory of relativity, but for the photoelectric effect. And the explanation is that energy electrons at, have two levels at which they reside. The valence level, sitting pretty and doing nothing, and the next one, conduction level, is separated by the energy gap, which is equal to the energy of electromagnetic radiation that strikes the plate, namely H times nu, Ein, um, Planck's formula. So Einstein combined Planck's formula and some knowledge about metals. This is a, a cartoon of this. If the frequency is too low, this will not happen. If the frequency is higher than the necessary, than the minimum value, the electrons will gain some kinetic energy. They will start moving faster. But there is a minimum. There is a cutoff. And that was completely impossible to explain using classical terms. OK. So now, these were empirical observations. And, and time permitting, I'll come to the situation in biology today, which is very similar to it, that led to the formulation of the postulates of quantum mechanics and the mathematical beauty of the field um, that we know today. Um, so the first postulate is that states of physical systems at this level, microscopic level, are described by wave functions. It's a complex function of position, time, and sometimes something else like spin, some other physical parameters. But it's not position itself. It's a function of position. In other words, you stop thinking about a particle electron as a ball with position x, y, z, and time t. You think about an electron as a cloud a cloud that is everywhere at the same time. It's here and can be on the moon. That's the way it is, I'm sorry. <laughs> so don't overthink it, just accept it. <laughs> um, and by the way, this, this period of physics, I think, and the period of science around the, these discoveries is the most incredible period of human activity, uh, maybe comparable only to Renaissance paintings in Italy, because th that was the, the time of the greatest geniuses assembled on the planet thinking about the same problem for, for about 20, 30 years and cracking it. You can also, and I apologize for the black uh, um, characters that you can't probably read, um, you can also think about these states, wave function psi, as um, Potential, potential realizations of some behavior of a system. And so if, if psi 1 and psi 2 are physical states, I'll, I'll explain in a second what that means, uh, a, combina a linear combination of these states, a superposition as we say in physics, is also a good state. So you can construct states by adding them up. Any superposition with some conditions uh, on, added on top is a valid physical state. And this is one of the complete um, departures from, from classical physics again. That is, a system like an electron or a proton, a particle, may be simultaneously in many different states. Like, like this cloud that can be everywhere, also different states. It could be an excited state or ground state. It could be, uh, you know, spin up and spin down. Um, and if this actually speaks to the famous um, anecdote, I guess, a, a metaphor, the so-called Schrodinger cat. I don't know if you've heard about the Schrodinger cat that can be both dead and alive. Uh, and I have no time to explain what that means, but I refer 
you to popular literature, Wikipedia will find a Google Schrodinger cat, and, and that basically is the paradox of quantum mechanics um, translated into living systems. That a cat, if it was quantum, could be both dead and alive at the same time, unless and until you conducted an experiment trying to determine whether it is dead or alive, and then you force it to be one or the other. And that's the um, next thing that I'll come to in a second. The second postulate is um, interpretation of the, the wave function. So the square of the wave function is a probability of being in a given state. This is how it, that's so-called Copenhagen interpretation. Niels Bohr came up with this. He was from Copenhagen. That's why we call it the Copenhagen interpretation. So now suddenly things go from completely abstract to something that you can relate to. Probabilities you can measure by repeating experiments over and over again on manifestly identical systems and counting them. Um, the third postulate is, is completely mathematical, out of the blue. And um, I, I will not try to explain to you because you need to take a course in quantum mechanics to really appreciate it, but basically it replaces physical parameters such as position, you can measure distances, positions, right, with a, with a ruler. Momenta, you can measure velocities, you can measure masses, you can measure energies. In quantum mechanics, these things are replaced by completely abstract things, Hermitian operators. These are mathematical objects with very special properties, namely their eigenvalues are real, real numbers. <laughs> Whatever that means, <laughs> You, again, I refer you to a first year, uh, first course in quantum mechanics. Um, and so the position, uh, position is, replaced by, is replaced by an operator X. Momentum is replaced by this uh, creature here, momentum operator with an I square root of minus one and, and derivative of X. And energy is actually a complex beast composed of the kinetic energy operator momentum squared and you see, if you've ever taken physics, you see some shadows of reality here. Because these operators have the structure of what we call physical mm, variables in classical physics. They look like the classical energy, but they are not classical energy because these are operators that means um, mathematical functions that operate on wave functions. Ma yeah, math mathematical operator. It's an operator, it's an operator. A function is a function. It's different things. So, unfortunately, some of it you have to take on trust and... Um, and the fourth postulate um, is, is the a canonical equation. If you ever took first year physics, you, you learned about Newton's uh, laws of mechanics. First, second, third law, and, and Newton's equations. Newton's equation, the second law of mechanics is replaced by the Schrodinger equation. It took Schrodinger all two weeks of vacation in the Swiss Alps to come up with this. <laughs> and, and of course, earned him a Nobel Prize, what else? <laughs> um, so it basically says that the um, time evolution of a, of a quantum state, a wave function, is given by the action of the Hamiltonian, the energy operator on this state. That's what it says. Um, and that's how you calculate it. And most of the undergraduate quantum mechanics, the three courses you take, is about solving this equation for different cases. Okay, this is the introduction about quantum physics. And now you might ask, where's biology? <laughs> where's biology? Where's quantum biology? Well, physicists think everything reduces to physics. So obviously, biology reduces to physics, and a trivial answer to it is, Biology is quantum by definition because it's composed of physical particles. It's a cop-out. It's not really true. Um, but it's a valid point. Um, and you might ask, we'll come to this, why isn't biology quantum if it's not? Um, well, I think, first of all, I think that nature... Uh, is smarter than we are collectively as humans. And it took us about, I don't know, 10,000 years, depending how, how, where you start counting as a civilization to achieve quantum mechanics, to achieve the understanding of nature at the level of quantum physics, which is the deepest level, 
quantum field theory actually is a bit deeper. Uh, so nature had two billion years to experiment with all kinds of rules of, of physics and chemistry and biochemistry, and why not come up with quantum rules if they exist? We know that nature is very smart and uses everything that is advantageous. So that's another trivial argument. What complicates matters a little bit is that, that um, within each of the fields of human endeavor, scientific discipline, you have uh, created um, rules. Maybe this is imposed by us humans on nature, such as uh, rules of elementary particle physics that include uh, objects like quarks and gluons, and quantum field theory rules it, which is really not very useful to understand condensed matter physics, which only involves electrons and protons, and, and simple quantum equations, like the Schrodinger equation. By the way, this is not the most fundamental, as we know now. The Dirac equation is more fundamental. Um, and within chemistry, also, you have your rules of um, how you build molecules. And as you go to bigger and bigger objects, quantum principles gradually disappear and become useless. Uh, doesn't mean that they don't exist. It's they simply, at least at the first glance, they don't seem to do much. Uh, biochemistry is one example, and, bi and of course cell biology. I mean, find a cell biologist who will write a nature paper solving Schrodinger's equations. Um, I think it's, this person will be doomed to fail. Uh, maybe <laughs> this year, but who, who knows, next decade may be different. By the way, as a digression, I gave a version of this talk two weeks ago in India at a workshop on quantum biology at the Indian Institute of Technology that introduced a program in quantum biology. I think this is the first graduate program in the world, and to, to my knowledge, that actually is focused on quantum biology. Um, and I, I actually expressed my doubt. I said, it's impossible to find students who can grasp both the deepest of physics and the deepest of biology at the same time. And they said, don't worry. We have a very competitive system. We get one million applicants and admit 7,000. <laughs> Our students are the smartest. OK, so the dimensions of matter matter, as I said, because at different levels, we employ different principles. And this is a sort of standard dis description in terms of from atomic to, to organismic level. And on the right, you have different fields of uh, science that are commonly associated with. And quantum chemistry would, would be what currently is assumed to be the largest scale, maybe molecules having 20 atoms, or, or up to 100 atoms, perhaps, can be described using quantum physics. Um, but we are now ver venturing to the mesoscale, which is uh, subcellular cellular components using quantum biology. You can also look at the energy scale. And, at the ver and this is actually quite, um, quite convincing to me that biology should operate at least partially at the level of quanta, because the, the cutoff area, the cutoff um, value for the energies in, in biology is, is thermal energy, KT. Um, Anybody who works in thermodynamics knows the meaning of KT, because living systems operate roughly at a physiological or room temperature, something like 300 Kelvin. And, and this is considered very warm for physicists. 300 Kelvin is hot. Uh, and I'm not talking about global warming, by the way. Um, so, so why is this important? Because KT in the units of Thermodynamics is about 0.6 kilocalories per mole, and uh, hydrogen bonds uh, are the weakest of the bonds that biology uses, and things like proteins. And hydrogen bonds um, vary in value from somewhere around kT to maybe 5, 6 kT. So this is comparable. And, and again, another trivial example of why quantum biology um, should be accepted is that, that all chemistry, all chemical bonds are quantum by nature, by definition. This is, this is involving electrons and electron clouds, so 
It has to be quantum. But again, that's not what these days is, is uh, causing excitement, uh, just to say that. So the question is, where does quantum weirdness fit in? Because as I told you in the beginning, quantum physics is really weird. It's hard to understand intuitively. It's not the way our um, brain teaches us, although probably this is the way the brain actually operates. And that's a, probably a topic for another lecture, um, quantum consciousness, that I only mentioned in passing, but I know that some of you are deep into it. So coherence is one of these uh, strange phenomena um, that means preserving a single frequency and in-phase behavior um, in the superposition of states. And by the way, I have a list of, uh, I forgot, I have a list of things I, I didn't want to forget. Um, let's backtrack a little bit. I told you about quantum physics as emerging from particle field interactions, tiny little scales. But over the century that followed, quantum physics exploded in all directions, including chemistry, but also including so-called macroscopic quantum phenomena, phenomena that involve an almost infinity of particles uh, behaving coherently. And you may have heard about superfluidity, superfluids. These are fluids that don't have any viscosity. And this is a macroscopic object that has quantum behavior, in-phase behavior. Superconductors, you must have heard about superconductivity. Um, in the last 30 years or so, superconductivity was observed at room temperature, close to room temperature, I'm exaggerating, about 200 Kelvin. So, so we are uh, inching ever closer to conditions that we would consider amenable to, to living systems. Just like we are finding planets in distant galaxies that could um, be um, places where life exists. Um, but the most important example, actually two examples or three examples that you can all associate with, and you probably don't know they're quantum, are first of all magnetism. All magnets are quantum. There is no magnetism without quantum spin. This was proved actually in 1910 by Van Leeuwen that magnetism is a quantum phenomenon. And you can hold the magnet at room temperature in your hand and observe its properties. So magnetic spin is a, is a quantum manifestation of, of natural phenomena. The second thing is crystal vibrations. Crystals vibrate at various frequencies that are determined by, its, by their structures. And if you measure a specific piece of crystals, you will see that this uh, follows a certain uh, law discovered by Debye in 1926 or so. And that law cannot be explained other than by quantum physics. Just like, I, just like Planck des described black body radiation, the bylaw described crystal vibrations the same way, and even at uh, close to room temperature. And finally, the one that you know intimately well is laser. Laser action is, is a quantum phenomena. It's a quantum coherent uh, phenomenon that exists at room temperature, is observed, of course, used every day now, these days in pointers and whatnot, and scanners, because it's actually forced. Energy is forced into the system and emission spontaneously occurs with the coherent light, single frequency, single color. So keep this in mind when people question quantum phenomena at high temperatures, room temperatures, and, and large scales, because, because we have examples of that. So these are the quantum biology, uh, generally speaking, refers to applications of quantum mechanics to biological object systems, whatever you want to call it, and processes, um, but usually refers to non-trivial applications. When I say non-trivial, meaning, no, no, chemical bonds are trivial applications, but non-trivial, something like superposition of states, being able to be at the same time in two states or two places, or entanglement, that is, two objects which are far away, they are quantum entangled. They feel each other's presence even many miles away. And I think we may, I don't want to go in this direction, but you may go into things like telepathy and, and so on, um, various strange phenomena, psychological phenomena, where these um, 
these things seem to be re resonating with the quantum description. Um, entanglement, uh, tunneling is another example of, a, of clearly quantum behavior. Namely, if you have a, um, let's say, a ping pong ball and you throw it, but you don't have enough, let's say, tennis ball, you don't have enough, enough uh, strength to throw it over the roof of your house, it will not go on the other side into the backyard, let's say, if you're standing in front of the house. If, if a tennis ball was a quantum particle, you could throw it into the wall, and the pro there would be a probability it would penetrate through the wall and emerge on the other side. That's how quantum particles behave. It's called tunneling. Particles that may not have enough energy to simply fly over a barrier will penetrate like a ghost. It's the property of the wave function. Quantum mechanics and life. So, um, there is a, a, a deep thinker, Seth Lloyd at MIT, who actually agrees with, with many of these quantum biologists that, that actually biology is, is very deeply quantum mechanical at, at the uh, fundamental level. Darwin and Schrodinger on, on the right. But at the same time, most of the people in the, uh, uh, definitely the granting agencies and, and most of the referees and, and people who are sort of deep into the orthodoxy of science would doubt it all because, and this is a whole list of objections to quantum mechanics and life. Uh, first of all, cells are big compared to elementary particles, but as I told you, qu quantum phenomena exist at microscopic levels, superconductivity, superfluidity, magnetism, blah, blah, blah. Secondly, life is hot. 300 Kelvin is a lot. Most of the quantum mechanics was observed at levels a few Kelvin, you know. It's super cool. And still now is. Yes, I have to admit. It, this is a difficult one, especially because wave functions get very jittery by thermal fluctuations and they lose coherence. So this is a real problem. Thermal de decoherence is the technical term. Um, the third objection is that living systems all require water. They live in aqueous environments. Uh, so, so it's a wet environment, and quantum mechanics has not been really found in wet environments, except for superfluids. And superfluids overcome um, viscosity. So this is a bit of a problem. However, however I have an, uh, a tentative um, uh, response to this argument. Um, Water in biological systems is not your running water from the tap. Uh, water in cells actually is organized water. It forms um, two-dimensional um, ordered structures with, with um, dipoles oriented in a hexatic lattice and, and long-range uh, long order, shall we say. More than 50% uh, of all water molecules in a living cell are organized. They're not free to rotate in three dimensionals uh, th 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 with three angles um, and so on. So that argument, I think, can be, uh, can be rejected. The next one, strong argument. Life is slow compared to physics. Physical particles change states on the order of uh, femtoseconds, 10 to the minus 15th seconds. Um, living systems operate on the scale of milliseconds, seconds, hours, processes in cells. Maybe microseconds are the time scales for conformational changes where proteins change shape and DNA unravels gradually over microseconds to milliseconds to, and so. So it's a very slow scale. If you, if you were to use quantum mechanics on such a long scale, you'd have to somehow slow it down because quantum states would collapse very rapidly. The next, the next argument, life is complex, require, and in terms of requiring different types of particles, molecules, well, yeah, so what? I mean, physics started with simple examples and, and then grew into more and more complex. So chemistry, then biochemistry. I, I don't buy this argument at all. The complexity is simply an admission of our own uh, incompetence, in a way, or inadequacy. And, and then life is not fuzzy, like in quantum mechanics you have 
uh, possibilities of many states simultaneously being present. I don't know about this. Uh, on some scale, it may be uh, fuzzy, and then eventually we force it to, to make a decision to move left and right. Um, and finally, uh, to defend quantum biology, nature, as I, uh, as I said, had a long, long time to experiment, and also is very adept at finding solutions. So it's a nanotech master. Um, and there's a lot of unsolved problems in molecular and uh, st structural biology uh, and cell biology. So, so problems which really lend themselves to physical thinking, away from uh, binary uh, uh, interactions like in biochemistry. So life is a, is a metastable state. Uh, what does it mean? That, that living systems require an influx, constant influx of energy to maintain their uh, functional order. Uh, if you cut off the flow of energy and nutrients, uh, the, the living system will become non-living, will be dead, and will end up in, a, in what we call a ground state, the lowest energy level. So you have to sustain life by flows of energy and creating this metastable state. Um, it requires hierarchies of order, interlocking hierarchies of order. That's uh, part of the complexity. So organization, but functional organization. Um, and it has been said many times, living organisms are open, open to matter and energy, irreversible thermodynamically, and dissipative. So order is created with the simultaneous dissipation of energy. We create heat. If, you, if we create an infrared map of, the, of this lecture hall, you'll see where the people are sitting because we are dissipating energy uh, uh, by, by being alive. That doesn't happen when you look at uh, non-living system. Um, okay. This is a list of um, people and, and terms that sort of presage the current period of quantum biology expansion. Uh, actually, it goes back to the, the founders of quantum mechanics. They already thought about this, that biology could be, um, could be a, a place where quantum effects play a role. And in fact, um, Schrodinger wrote a book, What is Life, in 1944. Uh, and, and he grappled with some of the uh, unsolved problems of biology, um, mainly negative entropy, but not only, creating order. And uh, many of the issues could be solved with quantum concepts. Um, so one more area where uh, quantum biology could, could also be uh, seen as emerging from is so-called biophotons. Uh, living systems not only um, um, organize themselves, but also emit electromagnetic radiation in the living state. This was observed in uh, early 20th century by uh, a Russian or Soviet um, biophysicist, Gurwich. And he created the field, field of biophotons. And then that lasted for another 70 years. There's many micrographs, many studies. I have no time to go into it. Look, at, look it up. You can see fields around living systems, including leaves of plants, uh, animals, and, and of course humans, uh, created as a result of, of being alive. So bio, this is called biophotons. Also during cell division, there's specific characteristics of, of electromagnetic radiation emitted by um, dividing cells in the ultraviolet range. So remember, we started with, with uh, Planck's postulate that energy equals H, Planck constant times the frequency. So living systems use it. So electromagnetic radiation is quantized and use fields of biophotons not only to signal to the rest of the world that they are alive, but maybe to communicate some other messages. It's quite um, interesting to speculate about electromagnetic um, communication at the cell level. Actually, 
One very serious scientist from Chicago, Günther Albrecht Bühler, dedicated his career to uh, a topic he calls cell intelligence. And if, if you uh, Google cell intelligence, you will find his website, which is amazing. He demonstrated how cells recognize others, other cells in the neighborhood simply by electromagnetic means. Uh, he eliminated, eliminated all chemical uh, agents and physical contact and demonstrated how cells recognize other cells through this. Mm. So now we are at the, uh, a point in, in our scientific adventure that many of these um, issues can be resolved technologically. We have very accurate um, means of detection and analysis um, and some of the claims may be verified or rejected as we employ uh, sophisticated te technologies, uh, nanotechnology in particular. Um, this is a list. Uh, by the way, uh, you will have access to all of this, uh, and I'm going rather fast, so I guess the PowerPoint presentation will be available through your website, I presume, so, so you can go through the list. Um, there was a ver veritable explosion of publications on the topic of quantum biology in the last two years, maybe, maybe five years. Um, and this explosion was generated by um, one particular effect, the photosynthesis, understood as a quantum mechanical phenomenon. And this w was analyzed very accurately in several groups in California and Toronto, Greg Scholes, and elsewhere. Um, and it was demonstrated very clearly that uh, both bacteria that utilize uh, light uh, as en the energy source and plants in photosynthesis um, utilize the same principle of uh, resonant complexes that capture quanta quanta of electromagnetic radiation and create excited state of electrons which then funnel to a reaction center and the energy is harvested, uh, funneled to the, the reaction center. So this is the most convincing to date uh, experimental evidence that biology uses quantum principles to uh, harvest energy. Um, and many of these um, topics here and papers listed to talk about this at the level of bacteria, at the level of plants. By the way, this whole topic goes back way, way back to the 1910s and 20s um, in artificial uh, aggregates called J, J aggregates or Scheibe aggregates. Um, molecular assemblies were created to actually harvest photoelectric, uh, photo photons, electromagnetic energy to reaction centers in molecular aggregates. This was done artificially for the pur purpose initially of photography by um, a German scientist, um, Hans Kuhn, and his followers actually wrote one paper with uh, Dietmar Mebius from this group in 1995, and we wrote a theoretical explanation of this ahead of it. Too late for, for the first application, too early for this thing, so somehow it got forgotten. But Anyway, it's a, it's a field that has a long history and now it's becoming very, very interesting. Um, and somehow you can go in a direction of great speculations. Um, uh, so Gurwich, Alexander Gurwich, also not only measured these electromagnetic fields around living systems, but also speculated that these are morphogenetic. There are something called morphogenetic fields. That and, and embryogenesis, morphogenesis is still a field in biology that is shrouded in mystery. How do organisms know where, where to stop, how to differentiate, how to create uh, organs out of groupings of cells? And so Gurwich came up with this um, concept of morphogenetic field, that there exist physical fields that guide the construction of biological matter. Um, and that, that followed with more modern applications of bioelectromagnetic fields, including Herbert Froelich. Actually, he was one of the greatest physicists of all time, and he uh, missed a Nobel Prize by a whisker. I think he should have been given one. He wrote on uh, the theory of superconductivity 
before the people like um, um, Barton Cooper and Schrieffer got Nobel Prizes, uh, he cr came up with a um, theory of uh, superconductivity, then worked on fer ferroelectrics, and in the last decade of his life, um, he came up with the concept of uh, biological coherence, that biological systems actually create uh, um, dipolar oscillations in a metastable state, which is coherent, very similar to laser light. Uh, so the, the concept of the laser um, inspired him to, to think about biological systems. There were some experimental um, groups trying to prove it. There is a literature around this field. Uh, if you want to believe it, then you will believe it. If you don't, then you'll dismiss it. I, I don't think it has been really conclusive, um, but it's definitely very interesting to, um, to study this. Herbert Froelich was actually a frequent visitor to the University of Alberta or the Department of Physics. He, some of his um, students became professors in our department, um, and they themselves since retired. But. So this is Froelich's long-range coherence in living systems. It actually required oscillations in the microwave region, um, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 hertz. I'll skip through it, uh, running out of time in a few minutes. Right? Or not? If there... <laughs> okay, maybe not. So, uh, this is an interesting object that should be studied at the same level of interest and, and um, accuracy, precision, as, as the, the um, chloroplasts in photosynthesis, centrioles. The centriole is an organelle in uh, eukaryotic system, uh, eukaryotic cells, that uh, is very intricately, intricately constructed, has nine triplets of microtubules, uh, forming a cylinder, actually, mm, yes, a single cylinder, with a doublet in the middle, and a centrosome is comp comprised of two centrioles perpendicular to each other. Centrioles are about 200 nanometers why? So it's a nanotechnology system. It really is a nanotechnology apparatus. And um, it, per it actually is the first thing to divide in a dividing cell. Before you see anything in a dividing cell, the centria will divide. So this, that's the, the first stimulus for cell division comes th from there. Uh, and I mentioned to you Ginter Albert Bueller. He studies centrioles and has a, a beautiful um, website which speaks to, to the um, complexity of centrioles and the role in perception of electromagnetic radiation. He has uh, claimed and demonstrated and published in actually some very respectable journals, including PNAS and Science, um, that centrioles are the eye of the cell. They actually orient themselves to the incoming radiation and can detect the direction in both, um, the angle in both directions to within three degrees and then sig signal to the cell, for example, whether to approach a given cell, if it's a friendly cell or not. I'm not a biologist, so I don't know exactly <laughs> what the consequences are, but I'm very interested in this because the microtubules are involved in the um, reorganization of the centrioles. Uh, these, these three, these nine triplets of microtubules work very much like Venetian blinds. They move and, op and open to within three degrees to allow photons of, of light to enter. So that's another uh, phenomenon that um, calls for a close inspection. Um, my personal claim is that everywhere uh, in biology where energy is transduced or produced, quantum mechanics plays a role. We've seen it in photosynthesis. Um, I've written a paper or two with a colleague of mine, Lloyd Demetrius, who came up with the theory of uh, quantum metabolism. Um, um, and the bottom line is this. Energy transduction in, in biological systems involves either ATP or GTP. In either case, uh, the energy produced in the process 
is uh, quantized, and it's at the level of somewhere between two and a half and take 10 kT, depending on whether it's GTP and ATP, depending on the concentrations. But it is a very subtle effect, and it is um, an effect that involves also proton pumps and electron transfer mechanisms. So um, the group of Vatko Verdal at Oxford is actually working on the electron transport mechanism in terms of quantum tunneling of electrons. Um, and again, I'm running out of time, but I, I'm just giving you some directions where to look. Uh, the organization is very intricate um, and in, involves uh, complicated biochemistry, but within the multitude of bi biochemical reactions you will find um, reactions that require things like potential gradients and electron transfer rates. So, um, how shall I put it? You may dismiss the quantum because it's less than 1%, but nonetheless it is there. Um, this is a few slides here on photosynthesis. And before I run out of time, I also want to, I made the second part of my note, refer you to some very cool um, applications of quantum mechanics and biology at the level of organisms. Uh, the first one is the sense of smell, olfaction. And if you, if you Google olfaction and look at Turin, T-U-R-I-N, um, you'll find uh, some amazing articles demonstrating that our sense of smell is, is incredibly resonantly tuned to a single molecular vibration. It's not the shape recognition, not what I talked about in the last talk about drug design, it's not shape fitting, it's resonant, uh, quantum resonant interactions. Um, so, uh, look at Turin. Um, the second thing is, w which I taught in my biophysics courses, and that's kind of common knowledge, our sense of vision, of course, is equally sensitive to photons, and statistical analysis of our sensitivity to light, going back to the 1960s, indicates that two or three photons can be detected by the naked eye. So these are, uh, conservatively speaking, double quantum phenomena, or triple quantum, uh, tri triple quantum phenomena. Um, the, the next uh, topic uh, that is also keenly studied is bird navigation. And I think within the last two years there were some papers in, in Nature on bird navigation as a quantum phenomenon, sensitive, sensitivity of birds to magnetic fields, cannot be explained classically. It involves quantum interaction with magnetic fields. And finally, of course, there's huge literature that I try to stay away from, and namely that's uh, the consciousness and cognition, where um, the sheer fantasy of the scientists has no limit and, and the uh, potential of using quantum effects in explaining how our brain works is enormous. You have till yes, but I, I was told that there is some time for discussion. I, I will, however, race to the photosynthesis because this is... Um, Maybe this is a good example where in this bacterium, which is thermophilic bacterium living in some hot waters in New Zealand, this was studied in great detail. That's the um, scheme of energy transduction through the various complexes. And at the bottom of this is the so-called FMO complex, which consists of seven um, multi-ring structures um, where, um, actually this was studied at the level of the quantum Hamiltonian and, and the experiments conducted on uh, absorption and emission of light artificially stimulating this complex involved interactions and calculations of the energy levels at each of these complexes. I even have, so that's simplified um, st structures. I even have, I think maybe I deleted the Hamiltonian for this. Oh no, here it is. Um, so these are the parameters that can be introduced into the Hamiltonian, where you have the diagonal elements telling you about the energies at each of the seven centers, and the off-diagonal elements tell you about the transition rates between the centers, all with all. And um, for, all, for, for those of you who are into quantum physics, I think it's very interesting because it's a real example of the power of quantum mechanics used in, in biology, where um, 
the experiments were explained at the level of wave functions, Hamiltonians, and the, even the quantum search algorithm. Apparently, this system exploits the uh, energy differences and finds um, in the fastest way possible the lowest energy uh, part of the center. So, um, you may have heard about quantum, quantum computation and quantum encryption. Uh, quantum search algorithms are also uh, uh, very much in the vogue, and they offer much faster solutions than classical, where you actually have to explore every single possibility. Quantum, because it's a wave function, it's everywhere. So it, so it almost instantaneously goes into the lowest energy state. Um, that's the schematic of the system, uh, which uh, actually was conceived like that, uh, with various um, spectrometers and the laser light tunable at different frequencies, and um, and the signal analyzed. It's a superposition of wave functions. Um, and superposition of quantum states were found to explain the observations. So the system is, uh, is really performing a quantum computation, and that's the uh, bacteria. Um, I don't want to get into details, there is no time, but definitely very detailed studies and, and very well received, published in the top journals, um, and, and demonstrating one of the weirdness of quantum mechanics, the quantum entanglement, that there, there is actually a system like these seven rings where the wave function of the electrons is spread over all of them and, and the, par the parts which co comprise the, the complex are in an entangled state. So these are the... Um, they inf for those of you who know a little bit of biochemistry, they inv involve amino acids called tryptophans, which are actually... Uh, fluorescently active, you use tryptophan fluorescence in many exper experiments on, for example, binding to proteins. And th the thing is, however, uh, for quantum interactions at the level of biochemistry, uh, there is something called the Foster distance, which is about 15 angstrom separation between uh, uh, active sites where excitons can be created, electrons pro uh, promoted to the highest level, energy level. And so tryptophans need to be close enough. And, and they, they are f forming this complex with distances around 15 to 20 angstroms, right at the, at the borderline. And um, so this has been um, postulated and, and hypothesized to occur, not just in this FMO complex in bacteria in the, cl in the chloroplast, but, but also in other proteins. So it's quite conceivable that, that quantum transitions occur in all proteins which have tryptophan um, arrangements in close proximity. And so one of these is, is a microtubule where actual tryptophans are, I'll show you I think in the next slide, where tryptophans are actually quite uh, easily recognized and, and mapped. We've done that. And microtubules of course play major roles in cell division and in the brain. All neurons are packed with microtubules inside the axons and in dendrites. So it's, it's not, maybe it's crazy enough for you now <laughs> to speculate that, that there is quantum ca computation going on in our neurons through tryptophans in microtubules, to be completely crazy. And where are they? So this is a microtubule lattice made of tubule and dimers. Oh, this is a network. We mapped this network of um, a lattice of seven tubule and dimers. So imagine a microtubule, open it up, make a sheet, and this is just a neighborhood of seven dimers of, of tubulin, and, and the red lines connect tryptophans uh, on the lattice of a microtubule. And their distances are roughly between 10 and 20 angstrom. So it's quite conceivable. And that's one actually an experiment I would like to do with uh, Greg Scholes. I, I talked to him. He's at the University of Toronto, a very famous chemist who's worked on these uh, photosynthetic um, experiments in, uh, in chloroplasts. And I, I asked him if he could do this for microtubules. Then we would have uh, experimental proof that, that that's not 
too crazy. Uh, so the idea would be to excite it with laser light and see if you can um, propagate excitations, quantum excitations from tryptophan to tryptophan throughout the lattice. Um, and then, of course, uh, what does it mean? Um, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hammer of another speculated about, about this being actually how our thoughts are being formed. Our thoughts, our cognition, uh, are speculated to be um, quantum collapse, the wave function, the electronic wave function microtubules collapsing on a particular pattern giving you the image of Kim Solis, for example. Okay, um, I think I'll stop at this. There was probably enough ideas for one afternoon. Um, maybe I'll, I'll finish with, with, a, with an, one more idea where you can use your knowledge of biochemistry and bi biology. So we talked about photosynthesis, energy transduction in, in uh, eukaryotes, uh, mitochondria, are very important in energy production. We all have mitochondria in our cells, and mitochondria are, by evolution, probably a, an acquired um, entity in cells, uh, maybe some sort of parasite or, or something of this nature. Um, they involve a, a chain of more than 20 reactions, one of which is, so it starts with glycolysis in the cytoplasm, that continues into oxidative phosphorylation through the citric acid cycle. And, and this is where I think the next frontier of quantum biology lies, understanding the electron transport chain in oxidative phosphorylation. This is probably where um, you have five complexes, five proteins that are involved in ATP production through proton pumps and electron hopping. The, again, just like in tryptophans, these electrons hop on the distances roughly between 10 and 20 angstroms. So each, each could be a tunneling event. And so th there could be a chain, maybe a coherent chain of quantum transitions. This to me is the best bet on the next quantum biology application. I'll just leave you with this and thank you for your attention. Who has questions? Front row, back row, middle rows, come on. So uh, apparently I need to brush up on my quantum mechanics a bit, but um, with stuff like uh, what we just went over with, with that electron transport chain, and it, it's extremely efficient, especially compared to you know car motors or whatnot, do you think that by understanding and elucidating more about the quantum mechanics of things, we'll be able to apply it to larger scale or different yes. kinds of engines? Yes, and by the way, thank you for mentioning efficiency, because this was one of the topics that was raised directly in photosynthesis and, and in connection with room temperature. The efficiency of the photosynthetic transfer mechanism increases with temperature, and it reaches a plateau at about 300 Kelvin. So actually, we may be living at a temperature which is favored for efficiency purposes. And in terms of uh, technological applications of quantum uh, effects, um, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised, of course, because now, of course, we have this whole wave of biomimetics that, that, that we are trying to mimic uh, nature. This is kind of retrograde because we are trying to understand nature through our primitive technology, but I think if we find that nature actually optimized our technology, then yes, your answer, your question will be answered. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. So I'm going to assume what you're going to talk about with this is like enzyme reactions would be related to this, like nervous transmissions would be this, the whole thing would be kind of the communication between the different cells, right? Yes. So, so I only covered about half of my lecture, but <laughs> it probably is already twice as much as necessary. Um, but the other half actually talks about something which, which is very interesting because we used um, metabolism and, and what we know about metabolism through the species, it's called the allometric laws of physiology, and, the, and 
translated into this um, field something that uh, physicists discovered in the 1920s, namely the Debye the theory of solids. You can completely copy these um, equations and ap apply to, to energy production in, in uh, hum human metabolism of other species and obtain correct answers in terms of the laws of physiology. But if you're interested, I can refer you to the paper and, and it's all explained in great detail. The thing is that you obtain canonical uh, scaling laws for, for physiology, namely basic metabolic rates as a function of size. So it's all hidden in the math. But what I'm trying to say is that, that um, it supports the idea that, that metabolism is a quantum process because this is exactly what Debye did to demonstrate that the crystals use vibrational energy, which is quantized as well. So we're saying, if you, if you accept the bias theory of specific keys of solids, then look, metabolism has exactly the same meaning. Our metabolism is a manifestation of quantum nature of energy production in living systems. Other questions? I just want to clear whether I understood correctly or not. So this quantum biology can be used to explore the dynamics of the system? Well, uh, y yes, I think the, at the very fundamental level, and you know, let me put it this way, let me backtrack how I see it. There are many problems with the current explanation of what's going on inside the cell. And one of the key problems for me is the efficiency of finding partners for biochemical reactions. How uh, efficiently and rapidly things find their proper ways and positions and in interact with other um, species. And I think um, this would be probably the, the greatest el uh, elucidation of biology if we said, yes, these systems at the level of proteins or enzymes actually utilize quantum recognition algorithms. And, and, and actually, then you can, follow, uh, you can expand it and say, yeah, you know, living systems are actually quantum coherent and, and therefore um, disturbing this uh, delicate balance may have consequences. And I would like to say that, that disturbing quantum coherence may lead to disease, uh, including cancer. And then there is a paper I can point to, to you which talks about cancer being a a disease of, um, that disturbs quantum coherence in the cell, at the cell level. So, I don't know if I answered your question. But One more thing comes to my mind, like I read about stochastic modeling in transcription gene expression. So, is that the application of quantum mechanics in? Uh, also, I think like eventually... We used, in my masters, I used the chemical master equation to solve the distributions for the transcription rate constants and all that. So is that the application according to you? I think this might be another application. I see, uh, well, maybe not this year or next year, maybe in the next few decades. Uh, it's a revisionist approach to biology. Probably all the textbooks like Albert's will be rewritten by quantum physicists. <laughs> With every example from actin to microtubules to centrioles to neurons. <laughs> being rewritten as a quantum phenomena. I mean, at the end, of course, we, class, remember, classical physics was not thrown out. It's not garbage. It's useful. But you, have to, but you have to keep it at a certain level. So classical physics is useful at the level of, of designing trains and, and, and looking at ping pong balls. But if you look at the fundamental nature of, uh, of matter, you need to use quantum mechanics. The same with biology. You can still keep your cartoonish visions of, of how cells operate. But if you really want to understand how mitochondria work, how various enzymes operate, how recognition uh, operates at the subcellular level, you have you will have to go to quantum mechanics. Yeah, hi. I was just wondering um, if you thought that, uh, if, if for example, if um, you, you, mutations in genes cause cancer, do you see a similar problem if quantum mechanics is 
behind it all, um, whether there is some sort of, uh, if problems do occur on the quantum level, whether they manis manifest in a macro yeah. scale. It's a good point. I, I don't know about the, the, the disease, but I definitely there are some papers even and, and serious scientific work on, on, um, on, on genetic evolution being driven by quantum paradigm that is accelerating evolutionary uh, advances by quantum search algorithms. If, if you, for example, there's something called the um, Leventhal's paradox in pro protein, fold, protein folding. Just a slightly different example, but somewhat along these lines, that, that if you were to explore the combinatorial space the, uh, uh, of, a, of a, a peptide that is supposed to make a protein, it would take more than the age of the universe to fold one protein, but they actually do it very rapidly in under a second. So, uh, so the, there are shortcuts, and these shortcuts may be explored by quantum uh, algorithms. So the same with, with the genetic um, variation and, and mutations. Whether uh, adverse mutations and uh, transitions to disease states have something to do, I would say probably the opposite. They probably deal with decoherence or some loss of quantum, uh, quantum coherence. That's how it, I mean, my naive thinking. So there are, there are natural disruptions that occur in the quantum level that are not beneficial to the larger scale? That's how I would think about it, yes. Less about the actual information in the field, but the field itself. Do you see this is going to be a field that'll just keep growing? I know you mentioned an explosion in the articles and literature about it. Do you think with increasing technology and ways to better see such you know, quantum level things, do you think that at some point this is just going to take off and go, really uh, you know, be the next big thing? Yes, yes. I, actually, I've, I have to tell you that uh, on a personal note, I, I got interested in this field uh, as soon as I got my PhD in physics. And it was too early. I spent maybe five years and I, there was simply no traction. The reason was that there were no experiments uh, available at the time to prove any of these things. And, and it's very hard to make a career on theory alone. Right? <laughs> it's, it's the you know, 21st century now, and it was 20th century then. But, but now we have technologies uh, that allow us, nanotechnology is allowing us a glimpse uh, at, at the level unprecedented before. So once we have more examples uh, than just you know photosynthesis and some indirect effects, uh, metabolic enzymes and so on, um, and, and there are some very serious places uh, engaging in, in this research. Oxford University Biophysics Group, Singapore National University of Singapore, and and um, and so on, who are investing uh, money, time, and, and effort and human resources into this. Now with technology, I think we'll be able to see rapid progress. It, it may be so. By analogy with quantum mechanics, you know, Lord Kelvin in, in his Royal Society address in 1864 said, "Physics is finished; the rest is engineering." Right? And then 30 years later, you know, Planck came on the scene, and the whole thing, you know, like a house of cards, co collapsed, and quantum revolution took place. I think we're at this level of being on the cusp. We have two and a half minutes. Okay, who else? Kim, how about you? <laughs> so, um, how would you relate this to the technological singularity and what's going to happen when machines are smarter than we are? What, what role does quantum biology play in I see. that? Well, I think this is the integrating principle. This is the entanglement. Now we see the whole, right? Because one of, the, one of these quirky, weird things about quantum mechanics is that you cannot isolate one particle from another. They're all entangled. And if you look at the living system, which is pumped at the energy level supply to the system, you're coherently involving the entire, um, the entire um, sum of the cells in, into a functioning organism. So I, I think that's the missing, the missing link. I think the biology has been kind of uh, walking blindfolded 
and that will allow biology to find a unifying principle. Wouldn't quantum phenomena in machines and in uh, uh, biological beings be quite different? I mean, they're both important, maybe they're converging towards something, but wouldn't they be dramatically different? That's a very difficult question. I, I don't know if I can answer that, but I, I think maybe that's the, uh, that's the spark of life, uh, the, the quantum ignition switch that needs to be implemented to achieve singularity. I think on the classical principles, I doubt very much that you'll see any, anything um, as complex and non-trivial as, as a living cell or a human being or our brain. So I would, I would, I would consider this to be a very important um, part and parcel of, of the singularity. So I, I think you've given us a very uh, uh, valuable lecture today. When we first conceptualized this course, we talked about you know that this would be a course that expanded brains, and I think that you've done that. That our brains have sort of expanded <laughs> right in this last uh, 80 minutes. So so anyway, thank you very very My much pleasure. for this. Right. Thanks.